start. And thank you so much, Aaron, and welcome uh, for being here, um, for going through the trouble <laughs> with the app and everything. We really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, welcome everyone. And before we start, let me give a little bit of uh, an introduction so people c get to know you a little bit. So um, Aaron Galloway, he's an associate professor um, at the Oregon Institute of Marine Bio Biology. And um, he did his uh, bachelor um, at the Evergreen State College in Environmental Sciences and Policy. And then his master's at the Central Washington University in Research Management of Wildlife Biology. And then his PhD at the University of Washington in Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, Ecology. And um, he does now really interesting research at the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology that uh, we will talk about today. And um, his lab leads the coastal uh, trophic, he leads the coastal trophic ecology lab. Uh, which is uh, focused on trophic inferences in marine benthic food webs, um, focusing on algae invertebrate interaction and kelp forest ecology. And um, yeah, thank you so much for being here. And I hand over the microphone to Victoria. Thank you. Yeah, All right, thanks. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, we're so happy to welcome you, Aaron, to Science Society, and I'm in Oregon as well. <laughs> so, oh, cool. yeah, I'm. I'm. Um, yeah, the topic that you are presenting about is is really dear to my heart and something that's interested me for much of my life, and and so I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say, and we love to hear a bit about a bit of background about our guests. So. Um, sure. my, yeah, thank you. My question is if you can look back in your lifetime and think about when you might have felt an initial spark of attraction towards science. It can really be any time, any memory that you'd like to share. Yeah. Yeah, I think that for me, um, being in the marine environment, like in, in the natural world, like at the beach, was just like the ultimate escape from the hard parts of life. And in my early childhood, I, it, it was kind of hard. And so I got a lot out of just being at the beach, looking at things. And at that point, I wasn't a scientist, but I was, you know, um, doing what all scientists do is look for patterns and try to make sense of it all. And um, I found that um, eventually I realized through a series of, you know, really fortunate events that I, could, I might be able to do make make a living doing this <laughs> and um you know because the right people got me the right information at certain points and i never thought that i could be a marine biologist until much later in life but um or let alone a professor but um i, I you know different things came to pass and um which i can talk about or whatever but the the point is is that um I've just kind of always been interested in um, the ocean. And so, yeah, now I, I work in this realm all the time. Uh, it's very fortunate to be able to, to um, have proximity to nature for kids. Yeah. There's just, there's always something to look at and observe. I work in arts and science education. And what you said is exactly what I share with my students that that you're sci you're being you're behaving as a scientist when you're observing and asking questions and yeah, yeah so yeah to hear you say that it's um i wish you could come and talk to them all <laughs> i mean it's such a privilege to be able to get to be a scientist for a living you know like i feel like i try to one of my goals in life was to like be able to have a job where it's rational i guess i would say like there's a lot in our society which I look at and I go like, it's not rational that we're that we do this or that we do that. And so, nonetheless, you know, people have to do all the jobs, um, or they do all all kinds of weird jobs. Some of them are more important than others. But it's a privilege to be able to do something where, regardless of how we were to structure any society, I think there'd be a place for scientists in that society. 
Um, so any society will have scientists in it, people that you know study the world and try to make sense of it all and make inferences about improving and understanding everything. So anyway, it's it's a big privilege to be able to do that for a living. And and also that somehow you were able to to follow your curiosity because yeah, yeah it's maybe part of the uh, challenge with the regimentation of school that children are told what to do and what to think and what to question and so but some yeah. of us continue you had your own questions and you were you could follow those mm -hmm. so perhaps you could tell share with us if, if that's okay if there's anything you wanted to share about your path toward this work that what what events brought you to this work that you're about to share with us today yeah i mean like um ever since getting my professor position i mean i've been interested in kelp forest ecology i can, so i can get more specific into this project i guess which is um just being i'm a scuba diver and i do a lot of my my work um in these kelp forests. So this first picture that you see in the, the slides that are out there, I don't have to get it. I don't know if you guys are all looking at that or not, but um, basically I care about these kelp forests and have started to notice, like many people have noticed that um, there have been documented declines in kelp forests. And so we are working on this um, particular sunflower sea star it's a species that um, has recently gone through major declines. Um, in fact, it's now considered endangered. Um, and so, and you know, actually, I'm not sure if I if I tell that story, it's almost like I'm giving the talk. So I don't know if I should do that or no. It's or, up or to what. you. Yeah, you can you can you can play your cards close to your chest. You can. Why don't we do this? Why don't we just step into your um, your discussion and and I pass the mic to you, and you can. Um, mold and shape your what you deliver as you wish and then Katarina and I are here um, to if you'd like to have a Q&A following your discussion and if if and when friends post questions in the chat we can share those with you and so uh -huh. you can decide what you're going to share and when and we've got your pdf that we can follow so okay. how about it yeah thank you so uh, much it's super excited all right I can do it like that yeah sure um, and how about this? If you anybody wants to ask any question at any time, just go for it. And uh, I won't give the talk like a standard science talk. I'll I'll give it where I'll I'll show we'll talk about a couple slides and then I'll pause. Okay, so so that it's more like a conversation or at least it can be. Um, so if Sounds you open great. up, yeah. I have, what I sent was a, a PowerPoint, but I have a feeling that was it saved as individual PDFs. Is that what you guys see? And no, it's a oh, PowerPoint. Sorry. It's it's sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> no. no problem. No problem. Okay, so let's go to the second slide, and this shows uh, a kelp forest. And I don't know how many of you on this call have been, you know, know about what kelp forests are, or have seen one, or appreciate this already. But um, this is a kelp forest here in Cape Arago, which is like just a couple miles from my office. Um, it doesn't look like this this year, but this is a couple years ago. 2018, um, and you see all this brown seaweed that's floating on the surface of the ocean. And so these are kelp, um, and kelps are large macroalgae. You can, I guess you can see the notes in the um, PowerPoint, um, but they're in a, they're a certain type of algae called Laminarialis, which is the order. Um, basically, they're just large um, organisms that can range from, you know, several, you know, 20 meters in length to just one or two meters. Um, so there's a lot of variation in their size. But the important thing about the kelps, they're diverse species there, but they're um, considered to be foundation species, which means um, that they play a particular role in the ecosystem as a foundation. So other big foundation species that are well known are coral reefs, mangrove forests, seagrass beds, stuff like that. So um, it's more, they provide habitat, but they also provide food, um, and so therefore they're a foundation. And then let's go to the next one. Fig the three, I don't know if you have a video, but if you click on the video within slide three, does that show a video? Do people see it moving? 
Um, so I the video in case it doesn't work for some people, um, because the the file is large. Um, it's the first video in the folder. So, thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, so basically, this video is an aerial drone image of a gray whale. Um, it's probably about thirty five feet long, forty feet long. A huge gray whale swimming around in a kelp forest here in Oregon. Now this is courtesy of my colleague, Professor Leif Torres. And what this is showing is a whale swimming around in kelp forest that's probably only 15 feet deep. Um, so it's pretty amazing. And this is just an example of um, kelp are important habitat for a lot of things, including invertebrates, uh, fishes. And recently we've started to show that even these big gray whales like to use kelp forests. And so um, let's go to the next slide, which is slide four, where I kind of have a cartoon that this is actually my artwork. I drew this. This is a the question is, what is a kelp forest? And what I just showed you, that last picture, showed that the bull kelp on the surface, that brown algae floating on the surface. But the reason I did this drawing is to try to bring attention to the fact that so much of a kelp forest is below the surface. It's not what you can see while you're standing on the seashore. And there may be a kelp forest underneath the water that never shows itself on the surface. So it might look like, oh, it's just water. There's no kelp there. Um, but no, there could be a thriving kelp forest of stipitate subsurface kelps and the associated community that's part of that. And then I just have a couple points about how kelp forests are critical habitats. They're productive ecosystems, and they're increasingly threatened by heat waves and from overgrazing due to e um, ecosystem degradation. So the next slide, figure uh, slide five, shows kind of a, a recent synthesis paper by a colleague that just kind of talks about that particular issue of kelp forests don't like warm water. And in, in general, the places in the world where there are kelp forests are cold water areas. So Southern Australia, New Zealand, Southern uh, Chile. Um, and then in the Northern hemisphere, like um, Portugal, all of parts of you know Europe, Northern Europe, uh, North America, Northeast and Northwest North America. Is, so there's kelps anywhere where there's basically cold water. Um, but they don't like warm water. And so these ecosystems are definitely threatened by the increased amount of um, glo um, marine heat waves that we're having. In fact, right now, I don't know if you've seen the news, but right now, um, like as of a few days ago, one of the most alarming pieces of news I've seen, and there's been a lot of alarming news, as you all know, um, but one of a really scary piece of information is that right now our global um, water temperatures are higher than they've ever been. And the last time they were this high was 2016, which was right before a big um, El Nino event, which caused some serious um, ecosystem issues at this um, in the all over the world, but especially in where I am in the um, Pacific Ocean. So that's kind of an intro. I thought the next two slides show some videos um, of a healthy kelp forest and a degraded one. So do it would be nice to know if anybody can see any of the videos. Is, has anybody successfully watched one of the videos or should I just skip it? Well, I have, but <laughs> I'm not sure um, uh, if, if anyone else has seen the, the videos. But usually if people cannot see it, okay, they will just... share in the chat, oh, this doesn't work for me or something. Yeah. And then... So until now, everyone seems to be okay. <laughs> okay, well, in slide number six, there's a video of a kelp forest in Canada that I took two years ago. And if you, whoops, uh oh, that's going to make a lot of sound. Can you guys hear the, the underwater sound? Yeah, yeah. It's... Okay, well, maybe that's cool. Um, but this is, if you can't see the video, this is a scuba, this is me scuba diving. And it's showing a, a very dense kelp forest with pieces of detritus floating around. Um, you can see the ocean surge, and it's 
moving back and forth. And in a second, you can see a transect line. This is how we know where to go. And in a second, there's going to be pictures of fish and a big sea lion that swims by. Uh, so that's a great example of a thriving, very healthy kelp forest. In that kelp forest, there's also sea otters, um, which are helping make that place a, a functioning kelp forest. Now let's go to slide number seven. There's a different video. It shows a, what we call an urchin baron. And I'm going to click the play. You'll probably hear the diver again. But in this video, it shows a seafloor where there's no longer any kelp. It's just a seafloor full of urchins. Um, those are purple urchins there. There's some red urchins in the background, but basically those kind of circular spiky things, those are sea urchins. And then um, it's just pretty much barren rock otherwise. The crazy thing is, is just like two years ago, this was a kelp forest. Um, but now it is um, no longer a kelp forest. It's what we just call an urchin bear. So that's kind of the setup for why we care about the research that I'm going to talk about. So you can go to slide number eight, and this kind of introduces the, the main character of our story, the Pycnopodia helianthoides, sunflower sea star. It's a voracious predator. It's really fast. Um, it is known to eat basically everything. Um, well, especially invertebrates. So when it was healthy, it was up to um, one meter in diameter. So I, I recommend everybody just take their arms and like, you know, hold them out there and be like, okay, that's one meter. And that's huge if you do that. And you think these were common all over the place, um, but they've been devastated by a sea star wasting disease that started in 2014 through 15. And they're now listed as on the, on the IUCN red list. And now the US um, endangered, well, the ESA is now considering listing them as um, threatened um, as well. So we've lost this very important large predator in most of its um, range. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. So let's go to slide number nine, <clears throat> which brings us to our research question, which is, if these pycnopodia recover, could they exert meaningful top-down control on nutritionally poor purple sea urchins that are living in barrens? And the picture in there shows another picture of a sea urchin barren. We've got lots and lots of urchins with no algae. So we call this a barren. And one of the big questions that we are addressing here is whether pycnopodia will want to eat urchins that are in a barren. So let's go to slide number 10. And this kind of sets that up. So what you need to know to make sense of all, all this is that there's basically around five different major predators of, of sea urchins in the Northeast Pacific. There's people, uh, sea otters, California sheep headfish, spiny lobsters, and pycnopodia. Um, and so all these creatures could impact um, sea urchins. But I'm going to show you in a minute that um, the, the fish and those lobsters, those are only in Southern California, so they have a small range. And there's only, only a few places where there's sea otters anymore. So the main thing that I'm getting at here is that there aren't that many major urchin predators left um, in their natural range. It was sunflower sea star was everywhere until this big waste, sea star wasting disease hit. And the other thing is that not all urchins are equal. So here's two, a picture down below show that there's um, urchins that have no gonad. That's the one on the left where there's nothing in there. And the urchin on the right has gonad with all that orange uni it's called. So if we were in a room together, I would ask you all, raise your hands if you've ever had urchin uni at like a sushi restaurant. So if you have, um, that stuff is, you're basically eating the gonad of the urchin. Um, and you're not eating like it's meat. So urchin uni is the gonad, and they only grow gonads if there's good food for them to eat. And so other predators are known to avoid these urchins that are living in barrens where they're not eating very good food. The urchins don't develop gonad, and basically it's like eating a spiky shell of nothing. So 
uh, like sea otters, for example, and people, when they come to an urchin barren, they open up those urchins and there's like, there's no uni here. Why should I eat this? And they move on. Um, and we didn't know what Pycnopodia would do. So we wanted to know if they would eat starved urchins as well as fed urchins and if they'd eat both. So let's go to slide number 10 or 11. And this basically shows what I just was talking about in a map form. This is showing how up this kind of a picture of the Northeast Pacific. Um, we call, as a marine biologist, we refer to the, the Pacific, this part of the Pacific as the Northeast Pacific, because from the perspective of the Pacific Ocean, it's the Northeast. It's, you know, it's kind of like the Northwest or the West of the United States, but it's um, in Canada, but it's the Northeast Pacific. So you can see on this that sea otters are in blue, lobsters and sheephead are in green, and Pycnopodia are in yellow. So once you take away that whole range of yellow, we've lost almost 95% of all Pycnopodia across that whole range. So for large areas where there aren't any blue or green, now we don't have yellow. So there's nothing holding these sea urchins in check. That's the point. Um, then there's two arrows that show the two labs that we did the work. First of all, Friday Harbor Labs at the University of Washington and OIMB where I am in Oregon. So we can go to slide 12. On slide 12, um, it just shows a picture of, that's kind of summarizing all of our research methods. And I can, I don't know how far to go into this, but first I just want to shout out to Julia Kobelt, who is our project te technician. I worked very closely with Julia um, and she is quite important for making all of the actual experiments that we did in the lab actually work. Um, she's a co-author in the paper. Um, and so basically we had 24 different sea stars. These are pictures of all of the individuals that we used. Um, and you can see they have different colorations and sizes. Um, and we used these different sea stars to ask um, questions about their uh, feeding rates, um, their choice between different prey types, whether the urchins were starved or fed, et cetera. So I'm just going to gloss over the methods for now. We can always ask, you can always ask me questions about it because I, I guess you guys have read the paper so or seen the paper. So I may not need to go into all the detail about all the results. I'll just try to highlight the cool kind of backstories. Um, one of the first figures of the paper is shown in the slide 13. And what we did, what this is, is just using that Y maze that I was telling you about. So um, I don't know if you guys know what that is, but a Y maze is essentially like a flume of water and it's a big Y. So the Pycnopodia is at the bottom of the Y and then there's two branches, imagine up, up ahead of the Pycnopodia and the water is gushing down, not gushing, but moving slowly down from each branch of the Y. And on one end of the Y, we have um, the, uh, an urchin. On the other end, we have no urchin. And this is what the first figure shows, panel A. And so we looked at what, how much did they, what was the proportion of choice um, between choosing an urchin or no urchin or no choice. And essentially they overwhelmingly choose to go to an urchin, which is good. I mean, we expected that, but we had to test that. And then when we tested the difference between whether they would choose a fed urchin or a starved urchin, we found that there really was no difference between their choice between fed and starved urchins in terms of just smelling them and moving towards them. So then let's go to the next figure, that's our next page, which is slide number 14. These results are in the paper. We did um, predation rate trial. So in this case, we kept the pic each Pycnopodia in a in a tank for seven days with, and we constantly replenished the, the um, sea urchins that we gave them so that we could measure the rate of urchins that they could eat per day. And basically we found that they ate about 0.68 urchins per day. And that um, if anything, they actually ate slightly more starved urchins um, than, than the fed ones. And what this equates to is, I mean, 0.68 per day, it's hard to 
kind of make that seem meaningful, but that's that's essentially boils down to each Pycnopodia will eat about five sea urchins per week. Um, and so that may not seem like a lot of sea urchins, but if you think about the fact that before Pycnopodia were um, lost through this um, sea star wasting epidemic, we think that there were about 3 billion Pycnopodia on the U.S. West Coast or the Northeast Pacific. And so we've lost 95% of those 3 billion. So it's just a matter of scale. Um, so that the fact that they don't eat that much, they still can have a significant impact. And we'll talk about that later. But we also found that the feeding rate was higher if, the, if they were collected in areas that had purple origins. So this took advantage of the fact that where we collected these sea stars had patchy populations of urchins. And what this implies is that the animals that were used to being around purple urchins did a better, um, would eat more purple urchins than the ones that weren't. So they might be practiced. So let's go to slide 15. Um, this is a, um, a GIF. I, I wish you could see this video because it's pretty awesome. It's going to explain how we quantified the animal speed and other behaviors in our lab trials. So um, if you can play the video, you'll see that there's a video of a Pycnopodia cruising around in a tank. And you'll see two purple urchins in the tank with it. And this is highly sped up, okay? So this is like, they're fast, but they're not this fast. Um, so play it again. I'm just going to play it again and again while I talk about it. But you see that what we had to do is make sense of 24 different Pycnopodias filmed for, 20, uh, for seven days each. And then we had to do that twice because we had to do it once for fed urchins, one for, for starved urchins. This, this was like terabytes of video. We did it. Every um, aquarium was filmed with a GoPro. So in order to analyze this, we had to train a, um, we used a pose estimation software, Deep Lab Cut, basically to train a neural network to recognize the Pycnopodias and then automate this um, movement stuff. Um, so you see on the right um, that exact video and how it is um, quantified after it's, um, the neural network has been trained. So this generated about 5.8 million rows of coordinate data, which we then analyzed. And so for me, this is a huge data set. I've never worked with a data set with um, millions of rows of data before this. Okay, the next figure is, or slide is number 16, and it just shows there's gonna be three slides that basically show um, results from the feeding trials. I'm kind of tempted, I don't know if it's worth just literally saying everything if you guys have read the paper. Um, I wonder if I should pause here before I keep going on that and just let people ask questions. Um, if if you wanted to pause, but I, I can encourage, yes, please describe everything there because maybe people have, maybe they haven't, and either way, it's it's fascinating work. So okay. I encourage you to, yeah, talk talk right. about yeah, and I mean, Yeah, thank you so much, always, Aaron. Great. People can always put something in the chat. I, I don't know where the, oh, yeah, I see the chat. Got it. Okay. All right. So you can always throw something in the chat if you need to, but essentially these figures are in the paper, but... Um, what we found is that this first figure is about urchin speed. So you saw the video, hopefully, and you saw the urchins running around in the tank, avoiding the Pycnopodia. They're scared for their lives because you have this voracious predator in there with them. And what we found is that um, starved urchins moved faster than fed urchins. Um, and we think that's because they're more brave when they're hungry. Like they're more willing to... Um, uh, cruise around and look for food. Um, and so that's the first result. The next slide is slide 17. This looks at the Pycnopodia speed, so the actual Sunflower Sea Star speed. We found that those did not differ. The Pycnopodias didn't have different speeds when they were feeding on fed versus starved urchins. So we showed earlier that they can't tell the difference or that they don't choose um, based on smell. Um, and then also this shows that they, they don't, um, 
their behavior isn't different um, in terms of how much they move around in the tank. Then if we go to slide 18, which is um, the next one, we looked again at whether Pycnopodia were, um, wh whether it mattered if the Pycnos were from areas with or without purple sea urchins. And we found that um, Pycnopodia source habitat mattered so that Pycnopodia from areas with urchins absent, where there were no urchins, moved more than the Pycnopodia with urchins where, from areas that did have urchins. So um, naive Pycnopodia are more active hunters, but they still cut less prey. So we think there's some kind of learning curve that the Pycnopodia and barrens um, may learn to be better hunters. All right, so then the next big thing was to, let's go to slide number 19, is to kind of say like, what does this all mean? We did some feeding trials in the lab to show how many urchins they can eat per day. That's all well and good. But what does that mean? So we did some modeling, and this is with my colleague, um, Dan Okamoto, who's an author on the paper. He led the modeling aspect, um, and we created this. Um, the results of our modeling are here in this first figure. So let's take a minute to just kind of like deal with this. There's a lot going on in this figure, but um, it's essentially a, creates a heat map of the purple urchin density as a result of um, the x-axis of purple urchin recruitment and the y-axis of pycnopodia density. And so what you really need to know is that anything in this blue, anything in blue is going to be a healthy kelp forest and anything in that kind of warmer territory like red is an urchin barren and this kind of intermediate area of like green and yellow is like transition to an urchin barren or transition towards a healthy kelp forest but essentially this dark blue is going to be a healthy kelp forest so the results of our model show that essentially um, the um, <clears throat> pycnopodia sunflower sea star can it will exert top-down control on purple sea urchins. And there, so th let's look at this in terms of like their densities. So this y-axis is super important. So right now, the, the dotted lines on the bottom, sorry, the solid lines on the bottom show Pycnopodia densities. This is a log scale, by the way, on the, on the y-axis. Um, show these are the densities of Pycnopodia now, now that the sea star wasting disease happened. And you can see how at the at densities of Pycnopodia that are basically zero or approaching zero, you can have a range of purple urchin densities that go from a hardcore barren to healthy kelp forest that just depend on how much urchin recruitment there is, like how many new baby urchins make it into the system. But clearly there's a lot of area where there's this red, which is an urchin barren. Where there's densities of like 30 um, urchins per square meter at least. However, if you go up to the top of the chart and you see these three dotted white lines, those are densities of, of Pycnopodia before the sea star wasting disease epidemic on the west coast in Washington, California, and Oregon. And this is basically showing that when you have the densities, based on this model, um, as, assuming that they eat 0.68 urchins per day, um, which is what we measured in our feeding trial, that if you had urchin uh, pycnopodia densities like they used to be, there'd be no way that um, purple urchin barrens could, could become established. Um, okay, so then let's go to the next slide, which is number 20. We did a model sensitivity analysis because this is all, after all, just like a back of the envelope. It's a fancy back, back of the envelope calculation where we wanted to know, we're showing one of the nine scenarios here. There's other scenarios that we investigated, but where we measured, where we varied the actual predation rate that we used in this model. So this is the most conservative of the scenarios using a lower predation rate of 0.59 per day. And then um, also showing that, um, assuming that the urchin, that the, um, Pycnopodia don't have a preference for eating urchins. Um, and again, 
you it's different than the previous figure, um, but it does show that at the previous densities that they used to be at, these top three dotted lines in the figure on the y-axis, most of that territory is still either blue or light blue. So even if they don't eat as many prep origins as we basically showed they eat in, in our experiments, the Pycnopodia sunflower sea star should still be able to exert top-down control and not allow urchin barrens to form. Okay, so yeah, it's fairly, I don't know if it, it, it's hard to give that talk in a room where I'm not seeing people and they're, whether they're nodding or lost, but anyway, let's move on to the next couple of slides. There's only three more slides and then we can talk about it all. So slide 21 is a couple of takeaways. Um, first of all, Pycnopodia, we've shown that Pycnopodia do not differentiate between fed and starved urchins. And that's a big deal because the other um, predators that we know about, humans, sea otters, um, and also the fish in Southern California, those California sheephead, they are known to avoid eating urchins and urchin barons, which don't have uni or gonad. So we have shown that Pycnopodia don't seem to care. Um, we, we found that there is substantial individual feeding variation um, between individuals, Pycnopodia, but nonetheless, um, we still found pretty significant effects that Pycnopodia could have once they get big on um, suppressing urchin populations. Um, the other thing that I would like to talk about briefly in this point is that this is just their direct consumptive effect that we're looking at here. So like their, their, their ability to eat sea urchins and make them go away. But Pycnopodia have important indirect effects, which also affect urchin behavior. Well, they may be direct, they're direct effects, but they're, they're not a trophic um, consumptive effect. So basically when these sunflower sea stars cruise around on the bottom, the urchins smell them. They have I don't know how much you guys know about like marine um, invertebrate ecology, but they there's a lot of chemical cues that are exchanged in the water, and they emit a um, you know like a chemical smell, and the urchins and other prey items are afraid of the smell of that predator, and so when pycnopodia are, are present sea urchins and other potential prey items can smell them and they usually alter their behavior. So the point that I'm trying to make is that Pycnopodia have also these important non-consumptive effects that can also make their role in protecting kelp forest even greater. So for example, if a Pycnopodia was there, it might scare a sea urchin from feeding. So even though the sea urchin is there, it might say like, oh, I'm not gonna feed on this kelp because I can smell my predator, I'm gonna hide instead. Um, so this is just pointing out that our work is only focused on the consumptive effects. So if you also include the, the non-consumptive effects, the Pycnopodia probably have even greater um, overall effects on urchins. Mysteries do remain about the feeding ecology of wild Pycnopodia and myself and other people that are in my team, but probably also others are working on this um, right now. So questions about what other things, you know, what are their actual hierarchy of prey preferences? We know they eat a lot of things, but we don't know where urchins fit on that hierarchy. And so we're trying to study that right now. All right, so let's go to slide 22. That's my thank you slide. Um, I would thank all my collaborators on the paper, co-authors, access to the lands. Um, we did this work on the um, ancestral and unceded lands of the Lummi, Samish, Tulalip, Kus, Sayusla, Lower Amkha, Siletz, Coquel, Haida, and Tlingit nations. And we're grateful that we were able to work in these places, these beautiful places. And we do our best to make sure that we are good stewards of these places um, while we're working there. The funding was provided by the Nature Conservancy and Oregon Sea Grant, a little bit from the Oregon Kelp Alliance and Na National Science Foundation. And so also thank the people that helped in the lab and in the field. And so with that, I can pause, take any questions, and we can talk about the paper if you want. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, this was really a wonderful presentation with, um, with really interesting data. Um,
that you presented here um it's yeah it's it's so interesting to see how you know this this organism is so important for um for the whole ecosystem basically mm -hmm. and um i guess the first question that probably comes to mind for everyone how do we you know drive up the population again um around the different you know ecosystems can they handle yeah. the higher temperatures can yeah. we put them more yeah, good question <laughs> yeah so one of the things that we're working on right now and when i say we i mean like the royal we like people in my field um are working on is um captive rearing basically um you know like a hatchery <laughs> not a hatchery but yeah something along those lines like um so there's my colleagues up at university of washington one of the people who's on the co-author co on the paper jason hoden he over the last few years he and his team have been growing basically spawning out adult pycnopodia um, gathering their larvae and growing them in the lab and to to try to make you know thousands of baby pycnopodia that could someday be released and really what they're focusing on is like the doing the science to understand like what conditions are good what conditions are bad if we wanted to grow pycnopodia for a future release how do we do it um, there in order to ramp up those efforts it requires first that we do the research which is what they're doing and then in the future we might be able to do if we get investment with money we might be able to do bigger projects that could theoretically raise thousands of um, Pycnopodia that could be released back into the wild and hopefully help them recover. And our results show that if they do get reestablished in the wild, we think that that will help a kelp forest recover. Um, but it'll be years, probably, at least a couple of years before these things start to happen at a meaningful scale. Um, we do think that if we don't do anything, who knows how long it could be before Pycnopodia naturally recover. They probably will eventually naturally recover. We're not sure about that, but you know, over the course of the last couple of years, I've definitely seen occasional Pycnopodia. So they're not like completely gone. Um, and then you also have to keep in mind that like one individual can, can generate hundreds of thousands of babies because um, they're broadcast spawners. So they have a chance to recover. And we can maybe help them recover through um, more active management approaches. And so I am involved in, and we're hoping to get um, more funding to start doing some of the pilot studies in the same way that Jason is doing the pilot studies of how to raise them in the lab. The next question that we have to address is pilot studies about releasing them in the, into nature. Like what happens when we do that? Do they actually do what we think they'll do? Um, and so in the next year or two, we have a couple of projects that we have a little bit of money for and that we're trying to get more money for that would allow us to actually study that better. Uh, what's the generation time in the lab? So they, um, good question. Um, if, if we have larvae um, within a few months, larvae will settle um, and then by the time they're about the size the, of the photograph, and if you go back to slide number 21, that shows a picture of my colleague Sarah holding a baby Pycnopodia that we found. Um, that one, which is about the size of a hand, is probably about two years old. Um, and so I'm not sure how to, you know, it's kind of to answer your question, their generation time. They need to be probably about four years before they start reproducing again, but they'll start to be, you know, the size that you see in that hand is probably about two years. And for them to be something on the order of like 50 centimeters to even a meter, that might be like five to 10 years, depending on how good their diets are. So, so selective breeding for for temperature resistance or, or uh, sea star wasting uh, resistance probably won't happen soon enough. I think that's that's a good question. I mean, for now, um, the what they're doing in the 
in the breeding that they are doing is just doing an extremely careful job of trying to avoid the possible contagion and getting the sea star wasting disease into that uh, breeding population. Um, what's crazy is that we still don't even know the exact causative agent of sea star wasting disease. So the first year that it happened, there was a paper right away where somebody said, this is a virus. And they had, you know, it was a PNAS paper um, that got a lot of press. And it was like, this is a virus, it's settled. And then since then, there have actually been um, questions about th that, not to say that that's like shoddy science or anything like that, but it looks like it may be, un it's still unclear as to like what the causative agent is. is. Is it a virus? Is it a bacterial infection? There's a lot of things that sound that look like they're conspiring. And I didn't really get into this in the talk so far, but it's generally thought now that the warm water has exacerbated the problem, you know, like, so like, it might be that like humans, a, a lot of us may have a virus, but it doesn't, it's not a problem until our immune systems are compromised. So um, it, it's very likely that these marine heat waves, in fact, the marine heat wave that was happening in around the time of the um, significant die-offs um, made the virus become a serious problem. Um, so kind of to answer your question, I, they're not specifically um, isolating strains or um, manipulating the genetics to be like, oh, we want warm water tolerant strains, but they are working with animals that have survived the initial um, wasting disease, you know what I mean? So like those animals that we do find in the, in the wild, which are the ones being used in the study, um, um, may have been um, kind of filtered out as being the ones that have the right genes to, to do well in warmer water. So, and does that answer your question? Uh, very much so. And fingers crossed that that's the case. Yeah. Hey, uh, this is Victoria. I just, I wanted to say thank you. I'm stepping back into class now and so I won't be able to hear the rest of this Q&A, um, but I hope that all the babies survive. And, and, um, and I don't know if you ever do uh, lab tours, but Katarina and I have a dream of visiting our, our guest speakers. So should she come and visit Oregon, then perhaps um, we could tour your lab sometime if you ever do such a thing. Yeah, of course. I'd be happy to show you the lab if you come to the Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. It's it's a long ways from from New York, as you know. Are you guys all in New York? I'm, I mean, you said you're I'm in Oregon, Oregon right? Katarina. Yeah, but she'll be here. <laughs> she'll be here. But Victoria can also go. You mm -hmm. can go. I know you want to go. <laughs> yeah, I could go and bring you on Facetime. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that would be great. Yeah, I, I, we'd be happy to to show you around the lab. Anybody that wants to come by, we have a cool um, um, outreach center um, which is open to the public called the um, Charleston Marine Life Center. And then we also, but I would also be happy to show you around our specific lab here. Yeah, Fantastic. that's so nice. Thank you so much. Oh. Yeah, I'm gonna go. So thank you so much. I'll, I'll sort of be here listening in occasionally. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, that yeah, it's it's really nice of you. Um, yeah, the idea was that one day we'll do kind of a tour and then maybe also speak with people, you know, technicians and so in the lab and um, yeah. kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's kind of a a little you know plan we had for one day when we have time and money to do that. We'll do that. Right. <laughs> yeah. To give to bring people closer to you know the people that work in the lab who's doing the research and maybe they wanna wanna talk about their work and stuff and um yeah it's I think that's really interesting. Do you think I know it's probably not a good long term solution, but in the meantime, do you think there would be a way to use Kind of robots that could pick up let's say 50 percent of the purple dots you know right. not all of them and crack yeah. them open and throw them on the floor bring them even i don't know do, do you think that's hear, a possibility yeah i hear what you're saying i mean basically 
I think the short answer is I don't think that would be um, viable or worth investing in. Um, we are doing stuff like that in the sense that there's a bunch of projects now all over, not just in the West Coast, but all over the world. This is happening. We're losing kelp forests in Australia, um, the Northeast Pacific. Um, this happened in Norway um, with urchin barrens. And so one of the things that people are doing, there's a lot of interest in right now, and I've been part of this. I've been part of projects that do this as we go in a small area and do like what you're suggesting, like human beings go diving and they just like remove the urchins. You crush them. You just like smash them with a hammer. Um, it's sad to kill stuff for no, you know, but I mean, there is a reason. Uh, so the point that I'm trying to make is that the scale is such that be, be in order to have humans do it, it can't, there's just not, they can't make a big enough impact. And then to have robots do it, we're so far away technology wise, it wouldn't be worth putting all that effort, I don't think, into um, developing that technology to specifically do that. I would rather see that much money, that much effort go into um, propagating the natural predator, the Pycnopodia. Because what we found in this paper is that if Pycnopodia recover, um, they should be able to suppress these urchin populations. And Pycnopodia have evolved over millions of years, right, to, to be successful living in that environment. So I would almost just say, let's let biology, let, we can help the natural biology, um, re, you know, achieve its natural balance. It'd be a better investment than, um, than the robot approach. But it's a cool question. Um, it's definitely interesting to think about that. But yeah, that's how I would approach it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I was just thinking, because, um, you know, of the time span, and you say we have to do something in the meantime, is there a possibility, you know, there's a lot of talk lately, and we had also a few speakers here talking about how the microbiome of different grounds, you know, forests, um, yeah. agriculture, and so in humans and so on, is declining the diversity. Could could that also be the chain the the yeah. the the problem in you know having these symbiotic organisms basically that are just dying too and make them yeah. more vulnerable? That's a cool question. I don't I don't know. I know that I do know that a lot of, a couple of the research labs that are working right now on Pycnopodia conservation and recovery, um, who are studying the causative effect, the causative disease, like what is the disease agent that's causing this? Um, I do know that those teams do have people that are also doing microbiome work um, to ask that question, like what is the difference in the microbiome between um, the individual pycnos that are healthy versus the ones that are sick? So I think that's an area of developing um, where our understanding is still early in its development. So I don't know what the answer is, but I do know that people are thinking about that. Yeah, that's interesting. And the other thing is, do you think that changing ocean currents also play a role in this? I don't know, is there maybe less, um, less uh, oxygen? Um, because I know that we just discussed recently here that also CO2 uptake is changing due to ocean current changes. So could there be like an oxygen issue too? Um, good question. I mean, there's definitely like on the on our coast and the west coast of the U.S., um, we have major um, questions about the impact of um, Ocean acidification and what goes hand in hand with ocean acidification is also hypoxia, hypoxic events where we have low oxygen events. Um, and I think that those, those kinds of like physical forcing um, environmental drivers like O2, CO2, um, pH, um, they definitely could play an important role in the survival of um, Pycnopodia. I mean, as it is, people think that the water temperature increases 
was one of the triggers for making for what made the um, wasting epidemic so bad. Um, but I don't know right now to answer your question specifically. I'm not sure that at least on the West Coast that there's big differences in ocean circulation that have occurred yet. Um, we have differences in um, definitely in water temperature. Um, and these are mobile organisms. So generally, if there was a hypoxic event, like um, they should be able to move a little bit to deal with that. Um, um, so it's more dangerous for um, these hypoxic events are, are worse for invertebrates that are like stuck to one place on the seafloor, right? Like that who don't have the option of moving around to better habitats. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that it's not a problem, but I, I don't think that it's known as a, being a big problem, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I see. I was just thinking it has to be some large scale event, right? Because you say that in different regions, this is happening. And I'm not sure how well this disease is usually spread so yeah. fast over, you know, different type of ecosystems. I don't know how far they travel, you know, like yeah. how do they infect each other at such a pace that it's affecting, you know, populations all over the place. And it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Cause all basically all the sea stars, not just Pycnopodia, but like we had this sea star wasting disease wiped out almost all the major sea stars, um, from Alaska through Baja, California, um, over those three to five years. And a lot of those have actually recovered. And now Pycnopodia is one of the few that haven't really recovered. And in the lab, they basically, if they share water, like, so if you have, they don't necessarily have to touch, but the water, you know, if there's one in a tank with another one that's also infected, um, they can get the infection. And so, again, there's people working on that right now who are studying, like, just how, what is the vector um, for the disease communication. It's pretty wild to think about the scale of Alaska through Baja California. That's a huge area. And to think that just within a couple of years, they were all, there was enough transmissibility that they were all wiped out. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Well, it's, it's, it's not wild if it's something that is uh, pervasive, but it shifts in abundance with something like increasing temperature, right? Um, and just in terms of the marine microbiome in general, um, I was searching uh, a few minutes ago, and there's an interesting reference that's talking about uh, uh, microbiome shifts, uh, which progress with the onset of sea star wasting disease. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, it's unclear, of course, whether that's the answer or it's part of the story or it's irrelevant. But, uh, I mean, this, this is sounding a lot like colony collapse disorder. Yeah, well, yeah, hopefully, I, I'm hopeful that they'll start to recover because other species of, of sea stars have largely recovered, and um, we still don't know why it is that Pycnopodia have been slow in their recovery. Could it be because of what they eat? Is that their main food source, and could the food source be the problem, that something is spreading in them, and that's why uh, they don't recover? That's a good question. I don't know to what extent that is known. I I don't think it's that, but I, I don't know. Yeah. We're, we're definitely, now we're going into the disease ecology aspect and there's people that spend their entire career working on that and I definitely don't. So I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I'm an, you know, I'm an ecologist. We each have like, you guys, I'm sure know this, like that, like basically with science, it's like, you end up specializing, you know, you choose these areas that you are good at, that you can specialize in, that you can answer specific questions in, and it's important to collaborate with bigger groups. Um, but yeah, um, as to some of the details about the disease, I haven't personally worked on that. Yeah, um, yeah, I understand. It's just basically where our thoughts is, you know, solution to find a solution. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eli, go ahead. Uh, well, did, uh, Preeti, did you have any questions or comments? Because I don't want to 
monopolize the state. Hey, everyone. Hmm. Where am I? Do you have a question or no? Oh, oh yes, I was just listening. I was I was working along. What's what are we talking about? Okay, then maybe you read the paper and then and then you can you can read. Okay, out okay, let me just yeah yeah yeah. I'll you. I'll just see that. Sorry, yeah, sorry okay. to put you on the spot. <laughs> anyway, so um, I'm wondering. It, it's good to I, see everyone. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm wondering. I looked at the the range of kelp forests, and uh, apparently they they include Ecuador and Peru, which presently uh, are beginning to experience El Nino. Um, I'm wondering if if there are any like field survey type work going on in in those kelp for uh, forests that might be relevant to this, or any plans to do so. Um, yeah, good question. I mean. Right, exactly. Anywhere where there's cold water, and so it's not just like the 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 far north and and south areas. Anywhere where we have upwelling, and we definitely have upwelling in Peru, uh, where there's cold water, kelps are found almost. In fact, there was kelps in Oman, um, as up to like maybe 20 years ago. Recently, the last little bit of kelp in the northern Indian Ocean that touches Oman, those are now gone. I guess. Um, but at one time there was kelps there. So, but th yes, I mean, I don't personally know the researchers in Peru, but I know that there's kelp forest ecologists in South America. Um, so to kind of answer your question, if there, if the what's happening is relevant for this, um, the Pycnopodia sunflower sea star doesn't have, um, its range did not go to South America. So, those particular that particular sea star species is not there and not really um, directly relevant there but there's other sea stars um, in the southern hemisphere and and species? and they, they have similar like ecology in terms of eating uh, uh, starving sea urchins I, I have no idea yeah I, I don't know okay well like I don't know which I don't know which I've never been there and I don't, I've never had a chance to learn about the sea star assemblages of South America. So I'm not sure what they are known to eat. Yeah, so, sorry if that was kind of an yeah. unfair question. But, uh, no, no, it's fine. It's a fine question. I'm just saying, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, if so, for anybody who's interested, I did put uh, in the room chat a tweet showing where where things are with with El Nino, and there are going to be some especially uh, hot temperatures uh, exactly off of uh, 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 Ecuador and, and northern uh, Peru. And you know, this is a foretaste. If you know, twenty twenty three, twenty twenty four are going to be exceptionally hot years. There are already. Uh, sea surface temperature records, which have been broken in the last couple of months. So um, ho hopefully yeah, this gets I mean, people's attention. I know. I hope so, too. I mean, that's why I started this whole conversation with that kind of big news that, I mean, we're, we, we're right now, we have the warmest sea, global seawater temperature we've ever recorded. I mean, um, yeah, it's, it's terrifying, frankly. It's not just about sea stars anymore, you know what I mean, or or any of these. I mean, these are, as you guys know, really big issues that cause um, loss of life, loss of property, big scary stuff. One one other point that I think is worth mentioning is that, uh, and and I don't know where the research has has moved on this in the last year or so, but as of a little over a year ago. Um, it, it looked like we don't know nearly enough, but that there is something going on regarding uh, uh, macroalgae kelp forests uh, producing uh, uh, various uh, emissions like dimethyl sulfate and, and related compounds, which act as uh, cloud condensation nuclei. And uh, it is believed that on net, uh, these cool the sea surface temperature. 
right? So this is uh, to the extent that 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 these these temperatures are are uh, causing the decline of exactly this this ecosystem that uh, contain that that you know keep sea surface temperature down in exactly these productive ecosystems, right? This is like like a a, a runaway feedback locally. Yeah. Yeah, and the, that's right. I mean, in the the same issue with these urchin baron formations is also um, becomes this kind of self fulfilling prophecy. Like once once the urchins get established, they don't allow the kelp to reestablish. So even if the conditions get better and you get cold water, and in theory you have the right conditions for kelp to grow, if there's so many sea urchins, they've created this alternate stable state where um, there's too many sea urchins to allow even baby juvenile kelps to start growing there. Um, and then you don't, you kind of get stuck in this other system where there is no kelp. And, and that's actually happened in large parts of um, kelp forests. Um, famously in the Southern, like for example, in Southern Australia, they've basically gone from a, um, a, a ubiquitous kelp forest to a urchin barren and then a, um, Kind of a turf algae system and yeah so i mean that's why we have to at least in my opinion my little piece of the pie i mean i can't do everything obviously but that's why i kind of feel like we have to take whatever action we can to try to help um i become like less of a pure scientist and a little bit of an advocate you know to, to where i like i definitely want to take steps to try to help conserve our kelp forests so that, like you say, so it doesn't continue this runaway train problem. So, yeah. Well, um, I gotta go, you guys. Oh, it's been really okay. nice talking to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. I, I, I was just thinking maybe is there a way to engineer the kelp so the urchins don't like it anymore? That was basically my last question, but- What's that? Um, Wait, what did you say? If you can what? engineer the kelp easier, that I don't know, it has some kind of bitterness oh. or something. So the the there's a kelp version that they don't like, basically. But yeah, yeah that's, I mean, that's an interesting <laughs> idea. But then the problem there is just like so many engineering issues where you that kind of a thing. Even if we could do it, could have very bad unintended consequences. Like. Urchins are a normal, healthy part of ecosystems. So we don't want them to stop eating kelp. It's, I mean, they're, it's just that, so the, I, I'm not, definitely not trying to villainize the urchins, but um, I would be worried that if we change the palatability of kelps, and I'm not even saying we could do that, but if, if we could, um, the unintended consequences could be much worse than just leaving it as is, <laughs> sadly. Uh, and that's just my opinion, but um, yeah. Well, yeah, thank well, you so much, Aaron. Uh, oh, Eli, yeah, did well, you want to? Just to say thanks for a fascinating talk, and and more importantly for this work, it's it's vital. Appreciate yeah, it. I mean, yeah, it's been cool. I will say really quick in closing that one of the neat things about this project is that it's gotten a lot more press than any of the other science I've ever worked on. You know, I've worked on stuff in Antarctica. I've been all over the world um, and it's it's satisfying to be working on a project that does get um, interest from groups like yourself um, it's getting press like we were I got interviewed in, by the New York Times they had a paper about this or a story about this in that kind of you know that science Tuesday trilobites thing that the New York Times does they they covered our paper and interviewed me for that and so it's cool to Every now and then, you know, you just do your job as a scientist, you do the best you can. And every now and then, maybe for whatever reason, you end up doing a project that people seem to care about. And um, it makes me happy that there's a lot of interested people like yourselves that are trying to understand, you know, different systems. Like you guys might not be kelp forest ecologists, but now you're thinking about kelp forests along with me. And that's great. So, um, Anyway, I appreciate your interest in it and uh, enjoy talking with you guys.
with all of you. Yeah, you thank you. Here. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful discussion and a presentation. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hopefully we'll hear you back one day. Uh, okay. And um, I don't know, maybe in a year or two. We, sure. if we still are all here. <laughs> So is this, I don't need, like, I have a question for you real quick before I go, which is like, I'm still trying to understand what this is exactly. I mean, I'm just new to Club Deck, but are you all, I know, Katarina, you're a professor at NYU, is that right? And then like, what is this group of people? Are um, they people that are at your program or is it no, this is, anybody? Yeah, no, this is like during COVID, basically this app started and people were discussing topics for hours and hours while they were uh, at home <laughs> not doing anything got it okay and uh, yeah then kind of different groups developed and people kept asking about uh, science questions that i couldn't answer so i started bringing people here to answer questions and then kind of developed in okay. its own thing basically and yeah good that's for you amazing. that's great <laughs> okay well okay with that in mind one thing i want to say is with the Google Drive, um, the I guess I'm okay with you guys have obviously seen it. Um, I don't know. Th this is my these images are my images, my content. I don't think I want to see that stuff to show up on the web. Do you know what I mean? So just to be clear, I probably should have said that at the beginning. But if this is in a drive, I would like to. Um, I don't know, just ask that you now close the drive or okay. ask, the, ask the people on the in your group. Or maybe you can share it, continue to share it with them. I, I don't know what pe how people want to continue to access the content, but um, if people want to use the images or the content of my talk, I would they would need per permission for that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, somebody would need to reach out to me and oh, ask, yeah. and I'm happy to share. Oh, yeah. But um, Yeah, it's your decision, maybe. really. So the link so that's why we really also like using clubhouse because the link to those the google drive we have for this uh, club basically uh we don't we don't take them down so people that couldn't listen now because i don't know they're in europe or they're kind of in australia or whatever wherever they are um okay uh that they couldn't make it in the live session that they can still access these uh, presentations, you know, okay. while they listen to it. So that's but typically some what people you do. say take it down. I mean, it's not too many, but some people say it. So, yeah, it's really up to you. I'll just go with what you want to do. All right. So. The the figures themselves, it's all it's all in the paper. I mean, I'm happy to have that all information shared. I just I just try to be careful about. You know, I, uh, so, some of the images in that were not my images. You know, they were images that people said I could use if I gave them credit. And so I don't want to see a picture that my colleague took posted on the Internet. And then it gets back to me like, hey, how did that? I wanted credit for that. Do you know what I'm saying? So um, yeah, maybe yeah. you can just add a slide to that thing that says, please, okay. um, you know, something to that effect. I didn't really think about that because typically when I'm giving a talk, I'm giving a Zoom seminar. And I give the seminar and then it's, it's over. So, <laughs> I mean, um, people can always take screenshots at Zoom. So think about that. I keep absolutely. telling you. And I know. And yeah. I try to, if I'm doing that, I'm telling, I'll make a statement about that. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, but always... it's totally fun. If you think like tomorrow or tonight or so, or in a few <laughs> days, take it down. I'll take it down because I think people can still understand what it's going, what is going on, even without the slides. I think you explained it really well. And so was the, the conversation topic, recorded? Yeah, yeah. If you also want to take that down, that's also fine. We usually record these discussions. Cool. Um, but yeah, and then we put the link to this replay on our website and so on. And we have a Spotify account and and right. so on for people that are in countries that cannot access Clubhouse. And okay, also, how about this? So. Sounds good. How about you just leave it up for like, I don't know, two weeks, and then you take the the Google the, content down. The yeah, drive. and then people still have the link to the paper in the chat, Perfect. so um, they can also look at figures in the paper. 
So it okay. it won't be and on Spotify the link is not there anyways. Like I won't I only distribute the link to the Google Drive here on Clubhouse, not like on Spotify. Got it. Cool. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Appreciate your um, interest in the project, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day or night, wherever it is where you exactly. are. Exactly. <laughs> thank you. Thanks again. All right. Cheers. Yeah. Talk thank you, you so much. Bye. And thanks for taking the time. And and thanks everyone for coming. And um, yeah, I hope I hear you all back soon next week. So um, bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Bye-bye.